I told the story of a John Munn staying in caves, shrines in the forest, where the monks had stayed and died. Whereas he survived. And he attributed that to his heedfulness. In some cases, it was fairly simple. He learned from Ajahn Sao that you have to be very careful when you stayed in the forest. Diseases were all around, and there was no medicine, or very little. And so you have to be very careful about making sure that you didn't get sick from your own carelessness. I remember reading about someone visiting Ajahn Sao in a part of the forest in the northeast that was reputed to have a lot of malaria. He'd stayed there for several months and did, did not get malaria. And the person recounting this didn't attribute this to Ajahn Sao's special powers, aside from his carefulness, knowing what times to go out, what times to stay in his net. knowing to boil his water, in other words, being heedful. In some places, a John Munn attributed the fact that he was able to survive to the fact that he followed the vineyard carefully. Sometimes the, the devas in the spot would appear to him and tell him that previous monks had been there and had been very sloppy in their vineyard. And the Davis didn't like that, and so they felt no qualms about making life difficult. But with the John Munn, they admired his adherence to the video. So it's good to remember when you go out in the forest and go out in the wilderness, you're being watched. And so behave like you're being watched. For me, this was an important part of staying at what Thomas said. There was always this feeling that someone was watching me. Now, whether it was a John Fuang, who I was convinced could read minds, or somebody else, I don't know. But it kept me on my toes. When you think that nobody knows, nobody cares, after all, you start pretending like you don't know and you don't care. And that destroys your meditation, because meditation is largely a matter of being very careful. After all, you're going to try to see subtle things in the mind, and you don't see them when you're sloppy. You don't see them when your attitudes. It doesn't matter. Everything matters. So remember the Buddha's teachings on what it means to be a person of integrity. There are seven qualities, and only one of them has to do with knowing the Dhamma. The rest have to do with being observant, for instance, knowing the meaning. When I first learned this, I thought this was simply a matter of learning how to translate difficult terms into easy terms. But the word atta that means meaning, it can also mean goal, purpose. What is this Dhamma for? Ultimately, all the Dhamma is for the sake of release. As the Buddha said, the taste of the Dhamma has one taste all the way through, just like the ocean has one taste, the taste of salt. The taste of the Dhamma is the taste of release. In other words, taste there relates to a, an Indian concept. When you listen to something, say so you watch a play, listen to a poem, you taste what's being portrayed. That's what you can take away. If they're portraying someone going through a particular feeling, you don't experience the feeling of that person. You taste the feeling, which is something different. If someone is being heroic, they're not thinking about the fact that they were being heroic. But you taste that. In the same way the Dharma is there. 
for you to take the taste of release, to remind yourself that's what it's all about. And what are you getting release from? From your own carelessness. That's a lot of what the Four Noble Truths come down to. You allow yourself to think in ways that lead to suffering. And you've been doing it for so long that you don't really see the connection. The suffering is so constant. But if you learn how to be careful, a desire comes into the mind, you ask yourself, if I acted on this desire, where would it take me? You start thinking about the consequences, and you begin to make distinctions. That's when you're starting to be careful. The idea that we're here for the appreciation of the oneness of everything, that's one of the most careless teachings you can think of. It's when you make distinctions that you begin to realize that there are certain areas that I have to be very careful about. And so this is an important lesson. It carries from the wilderness over into every aspect of the practice. The other aspect of being in the wilderness, aside from being heedful, is learning how to use your ingenuity. You don't have all the conveniences that you had before when you lived at home. So you have to learn how to make do. You learn how to learn how to thrive in new circumstances. And that requires that you think. There's a famous passage in the commentary talking about how when Moggallan and Sariputta and actually it's in the Vinaya. Mughalana and Sariputta have both become stream enters, having heard the Dhamma. Sariputta heard it from Asaji. Mughalana heard it from Sariputta. They decided they had to go see the Buddha. So they went to see their teacher to say goodbye. And they invited him to go along. He didn't go along. The commentary's version is he said, the Buddha's teaching is something that's very subtle. Only people of intelligence will appreciate it. My teaching is dumb. Anybody can appreciate it. I'm more likely to have followers if I continue with this dumb teaching. And so the teaching does require thought. It requires that you look at what you're doing and reflect on it. See distinctions. If you come up with a problem, you're going to have to solve it. Part of it lies in having the confidence that you're not going to come up with any problems that haven't been faced by people on the path before. Somebody has gotten past this problem. There must be a way around it. And then you use your ingenuity. The Thai chants like to use the word sati panya. Sati means mindfulness, banya means discernment, and the combination in Thai means intelligence. It goes together with a, another Pali word, batipana, that a John Fung like to use a lot. In Thai, it's batipan. It means using your ingenuity, using your imagination. When you come up against an obstacle, how can you get around it? Is it an obstacle you have to go through? Is it an obstacle you have to go around? Is it an obstacle that you've made? How did you make it? If you see it as something as simply like a rock in your path, it's going to limit your, your range of solutions. But if you ask yourself, what did I do to make this? Because again, that's the message of the Four Noble Truths. You've been making the problems. And so it's a question of catching yourself in the act. When I first started out with the John Lee method, there was a period when I found myself getting really tense. The breath seemed very harsh. I couldn't figure out why. Until I began to realize that the very moment when I decided when I was that I was going to focus on the breath, I would tense up. 
the little tiny muscles in the blood vessels. And once that got in, in place, it was hard to get it out. But once I saw myself doing it, I could undo it, and the breath would flow naturally. So look to see where you're causing the problem. The problems that get in the way of getting the mind to settle down. And get in the way of seeing things for what they are. Come from something you're doing. And often it's oftentimes it's something you're not aware you're doing. Which is why you have to think. Ask questions. Turn the questions inside out. If you want to get unexpected answers, which is what we're looking for, sometimes you have to ask some unexpected questions. So the practice of the Dharma is not simply a matter of doing as you're told. In some areas, as with the precepts, we abide by them. But there's so much that's not covered by the precepts. Where you have to look at yourself and ask yourself, what am I doing? And learn to look at issues from many angles. John Swett told this story one time of two different Ajans, one Ajan Fun, who was his own Ajan, and another Ajan. Both had to build dams in their monastery. And John Fun built his so that it was higher than the, the land around it. Whereas the other John was in a monastery, it was in the mountains, so he couldn't do that. But he didn't think of building a spillway. And in both cases, both dams were flooded at one point, and John Fun's dam survived. Because when the water came and it got high, it didn't have to go through the dam, it went around it. Whereas the other John's dam was destroyed. And John, so I told this story, not to brag about a John Fun, but to point out that you have to use your intelligence. You have to think about things. Be prepared. Anticipate different problems before they arise. And that's what it means to use your sati panya, to use your intelligence. So those are two qualities that are always good to think about as you go in the forest, as you go in the wilderness, and as you're staying here meditating. It's good to bring the lessons of the wilderness into areas that are not wild. Because the lessons still apply. Your actions do make a difference, so you have to be careful. The problems of the mind are caused by things you're doing that you don't know you're doing. That's what ignorance means. So you have to figure out how to get yourself more sensitive to what you're doing. This is where you exercise your intelligence. The purpose of all this, of course, is to more than simply survive in the wilderness. It's to get the mind to thrive. I know some people complain, all this attention to minutia seems to put a straitjacket around their minds. But actually it's liberating. It frees you from the mind's abstractions. It frees you from the mind's ignorance. You focus on things that are right before your eyes, and you look at them carefully. And you're careful about your choices. And in doing so, you you get to taste the meaning, the purpose of the Dhamma. Because sometimes it's in the little things where you're going to find release.